Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. There's a little parable, kind of a metaphor, that talks about three types of givers. Now, since my sermon today is about the Sabbath day, you might be wondering, why am I talking about giving? But it, I think it's important for us to start with where the perspective is for how Jesus was perceived then from the Gospel of Mark, as well as how people do uh, think about Jesus today. The three types of givers are the people can be like the flint, the sponge, or the honeycomb. The flint is something that you can't get anything out of it unless you hammer it and then all you get is chips and sparks. The sponge is some people where you have to squeeze them to get anything out of them and it's really hard and then you just got to keep squeezing in order to get anything out. And so some people are very, very uh, you know, not, not generous and not willing to give to anybody unless you squeeze them. And then there's the honeycomb, which overflows with its sweetness. And that is really the way God is. Now, so those three things are not to talk necessarily about the people in a church and how we should be more like the honeycomb, because really we need to start with God. And that's the problem that the Pharisees had when they came to looking at Jesus as he walked through that field, as he observed him on a Sabbath day, picking grains from the wheat. Now, in their minds, this was a clear violation of the Sabbath. Let's remind ourselves what the Sabbath day is. We heard it from Deuteronomy chapter 5, which is the second retelling of the Ten Commandments in the Torah and the first five books of Moses. The first time is in Exodus 20 at Mount Sinai. And God says that we should remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Well, what does that have to do with giving? What does that have to do with our lives today? Because if you look at it technically, the Sabbath day is the seventh day. Which day of the week is the seventh day? Saturday. So for the people of God in the Old Testament, they were to observe resting on Saturdays. That was their Sabbath. And the Pharisees were more concerned with their interpretation of the law than doing right. That's why they came up with a list of different types of work. So during the, just before the time of Jesus, around 200 BC, the Mishnah, which is a, a Jewish interpretation, like a commentary on the Old Testament, had been collected. And this was really their standard. They said, we know what work is, and so we're going to define it, and if you break any of these things in, you're breaking the Sabbath law. So that included harvesting. If you rub some grains of wheat between your hands and two grains fell off, maybe it was a mistake. But three or more grains is definitely harvesting, and that's work, and that's breaking the Sabbath day. They even knew how many steps you could take. If you walked more than a thousand steps on the Sabbath day, that was traveling, and that was, or journeying, and that was breaking the Sabbath. And so people were very careful to make sure they didn't go that far. Uh, in modern day Judaism, they would say, well, if you're inside of your house or your community, then more than a thousand steps is okay. And so they have to define their communities. So in certain places, like in New York City, you might find a nylon cord that surrounds an area that's defined as their community. So you don't, uh, if you're a Hasidic Jewish person, don't break the Sabbath. So from the year 200 BC, the Pharisees had carefully identified all the ways you could break the Sabbath. And they saw that Jesus had already crossed that line in their minds. And they knew that Jesus had... Uh, his own way of doing things, and they didn't like it. What was so wrong about him feeding his disciples on the Sabbath day? Well, it comes down to the idea that they really loved their rules more than they loved people. And Jesus knew this. He knew what was in their hearts. He knew that, it, that they were trying to catch him breaking it. That's why when he went to the... Um, to the synagogue on that Sabbath day in the beginning of chapter 3 of Mark, it tells us that he saw a man who was uh, crippled with a shriveled hand. And he knew what they were thinking because they had already brought up the whole thing about breaking the Sabbath day earlier. And so he decides he's going to cure this man on a day when 
practicing medicine as a doctor would get him in trouble. Because again, it came down to the interpretation. So what was that interpretation? Earlier in Mark chapter 2, uh, Jesus revealed that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. He reveals to us that David, the king of Israel, who the Pharisees would certainly honor, had done something similar. He was uh, very hungry on a military campaign with his men in the book of uh, 1 Samuel. And in chapter 21 of that book, he finds himself at, a, at the synagogue or, or at the place where the, uh, the tabernacle was, and Abiathar is the, uh, or El Ahimelech was the name of the priest at that time. And so uh, Abiathar was the name of his father. So Mark lists the father of the high priest. And uh, Matthew and Luke, when they quote this passage to make sure that it's uh, a correct, they don't mention the name of the high priest. But we see that they know what the problem is, that going through uh, on a military campaign, God had commanded David. He was hungry. It was the Sabbath day. There was no food, and so he asked to eat of the sacred bread that was in the tabernacle. And, of course, we read it in our text. It was only for the priests to eat. How could David do this? Because feeding David, sustaining his life, that was something that is certainly more important than letting the bread sit there as a holy symbol of honoring God. Because doesn't God get honored more when we care for others? Think about all of the parables of Jesus where he says this over and over again. Jesus gave the parable of the Good Samaritan. And that Samaritan who was dying, or uh, the guy who was beaten up by robbers was dying, and then the Levite and the priest in that parable walk by him because they don't want to become ceremonially unclean. They don't want to get in trouble with going to do their work at the t temple and possibly being uh, you know, kicked out because they have done something wrong, because they may have touched a dead body, which is uh, a no-no, and then you would have to be separated from the community for a week. They didn't know if the guy who had been beaten up by the robbers was dead, and they weren't willing to find out. But the Samaritan, who was an enemy of the Jewish people, and he could have certainly thought, this guy is a person who, if I saw him on any other day, would not give me the time of day. But he saw him in need. He saw him dying. And he went and bandaged him, washed his wounds. He took him to a, an inn so that he might be cared for. And so Jesus' parables often showcase the point of view, the perspective of how we approach God. Do you think that God is stingy? Do you think that he's like a flint, that he's so hard? He doesn't want to give you anything unless you hammer him with your prayers and beg him and he finally might give you a couple of chips and sparks that you won't necessarily get through life unless you're begging God. A lot of the Pharisees probably thought of God like that. He's a judge. He's hard and we can't always get the things we want in life unless we live a perfect life. But then there's the idea of the sponge. Is God more like that? Do we need to squeeze him and try to show him that we're so sorry and we need the things that he gives us and if we beg him, then he'll finally give us what we want? Well, both of those ways are not, they're not true about who God is because God is a generous God. God is a loving God. He is more like the honeycomb. He will give us out of the sweetness of his love the things that we need, and it overflows. As it says in Psalm 23, the goodness of God, it, it's a cup that he fills that overflows into our lives. So if David was justified in eating the holy bread of the presence, so would Jesus. And they knew that this was his point, and they didn't want to push it because they didn't want to actually say that Jesus was right. Why is Jesus trying to compare himself to David? Well, certainly there's two reasons for that. First of all, to show that what he was doing was okay, that he wasn't breaking the law, actually, according to the Old Testament. 
And uh, secondly, he was trying to show his connection to David. David is the king who is so honored that God gave him a promise that he would have uh, one of his sons, his descendants, who would rule forever. That promise of the covenant that God made with David in 2 Samuel 7 is fulfilled in Jesus, who is the son of David, who is the true king who would come afterwards, who would be greater than David. The, the Pharisees didn't want to acknowledge that, and they certainly didn't want to uh, have any more conversations with Jesus about that. And so when Jesus shows up in the, in the synagogue that next Sunday, he ends up having to uh, talk more about this by his actions. He addresses the whole idea about what is more important in life. Are rules more important than people? Did God create the Sabbath day so that humans might keep it and honor it and make sure that God is remembered? Then we could even ask ourselves, are we doing that ourselves? We're not worshiping on Saturdays any longer. So why do Christians worship on Sunday? The answer has to do with what it says in the book of Hebrews about how there is a Sabbath for God's people. And that Sabbath is found in Jesus Christ. That he has taken care of any work that you and I would ever have to do to save ourselves, to get into heaven, to be accepted by God or to become a child of God. We rest from our labor of trying to earn God's love because it's been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He is our Sabbath rest. And so we remember what Jesus has done for us through God's acceptance of his payment for our sin as he rose from the dead on Sunday, Easter Sunday. So Christians have honored God's gift, his outpouring and outflowing of his love like the honeycomb on Sundays as our Sabbath. But does that mean that we should abstain from all work? I mean, isn't that what it says specifically in the text from Deuteronomy? That you should work for six days and on the seventh day you should rest? Well, certainly that could be one way that you do it. And I think that a lot of Christians through the centuries have really interpreted that way. You shouldn't work on Sunday and, and things like that. But what about doctors? What about emergency technicians? What about the people who are in the police, in the military? Do we just stop working on those days? Well, we know that that's not going to happen. And we know that we need those things. God's desire for the Sabbath has more to do with what is your priority than the day that you worship. But it is true that God knows best. And so the whole idea of the Sabbath and the literal rest is more than just a metaphor because we can see that it works. There's been studies and things, but I found an interesting story about the Sabbath that kind of proves the point. It was back, back in the 1840s when wagon trains were crossing the American West. And in St. Louis, a group of Christians was heading to Oregon. And as they were going, they realized that the winter was approaching. They weren't getting there fast enough. And so they came a point partway through their journey that they decided they had an argument about whether they should be traveling all seven days or if they should continue to practice what they were doing was on, the, on Sundays, no traveling, and they would just rest on Sunday. Well, the group couldn't decide, and so they split into two groups. One with their wagon train traveling seven days a week, and the other only six and resting on Sundays. Well, wouldn't you know it that the group that observed the Sabbath rest and only traveled six days out of the week arrived in Oregon first. After thousands of miles with the wagon trains, the ones who were the most rested were the ones who were more efficient in their traveling because they had more strength. You see, God knows what you need. He knows that the Sabbath rest is resting in Jesus, but it also means prioritizing the things that are important. Is Jesus the Lord of your Sabbath? Why are you here? Is it because you want to see friends? Is it because you enjoy uh, being able to get out of the house? Is it, you know, what other, of, other reasons people might have for going to church? But if the reason is that you love the Lord Jesus, if it's because you want to honor him with your heart and your life and your words and your prayers, then you are 
observing the Sabbath. Because the word holy means to be set apart. And the Sabbath day was set apart because it was a time in which God's people showed to the rest of the world that they would be taken care of by their God, even if they didn't work seven days a week. I mean, what happens when you work all the time? It's because you believe that without it, you're not going to have enough, that you're not going to be able to make it, that you're maybe you can make a little bit more if you work a little bit longer. But that's just not true because that's not trusting in God. That's not believing that God will provide on the Sabbath day. The people of the Old Testament also had the same problem. When they wandered in the wilderness in the book of Numbers, they ended up, God said, don't collect the manna, which was the bread from heaven that would appear on the ground every morning. Uh, six days a week they would collect it on, in the morning, and then on Friday they were supposed to collect twice as much because on Saturday there would be nothing. But what happened the first time when Moses told them to, about this? On Saturday, people went out looking for the manna, but they found nothing because they were supposed to collect it the day before twice as much so that they could rest. So in their disobedience, they learned that they needed to trust in God and he would provide. What does Jesus teach us? Our Father who art in heaven. And he goes through the Lord's Prayer and says, give us this day our daily bread. Notice he doesn't say, Lord, give us our weekly bread or our monthly bread or our yearly bread or our, our bread for retirement. He provides for us daily and we can go to him daily. We can trust that he's going to care for us each day. And so when Jesus says he's the Lord of the Sabbath, he's telling us he's there to provide, that he's the one who is the one who will grant healing and he will do what's best. He does what's right for our lives. He had to show this to the people when he said, what's, it, what's better to do on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? I mean, the answer to that is obvious. But why didn't anybody answer when Jesus asked that question when he was at church? The reason was because their hearts were hardened. And what did that say? What did Jesus react to that? It tells us that he was angered in his heart because of their stubbornness. There's only like three times in the New Testament where Jesus is angry and one of those was when he overturned the money changers because they had turned God's house and that was supposed to be a house of prayer into a house of commerce. And now he was angered when he was standing in front of a group of so-called believers in the Lord, his brothers and sisters in faith. And they couldn't answer the question, is it better to help people or to hurt people? We all know the answer to that. But do we know that Jesus as the Lord of the Sabbath means for us that we can turn to him for all that we need? Does that register in our minds that it doesn't matter which day you worship, but that we worship, that's important. That we don't need to look down on people and judge them according to whether they're in church or not in church, but we should encourage them to find time and a place to be able to commune with God? Are we encouraging people to take that time to, to do that? Are we being an example ourselves? Certainly we think we're an example when we say, oh, our neighbors see us driving out of our driveway on Sunday morning when they're just sitting in there resting, and that's our witness. But have you invited them? Have you asked them to join you? And whether or not they go to this church or another church, really God wants people to know that he loves them, that he's there for them, and that in God's house we are healed. Our shriveled hearts stretch forth into the world to embrace the love of God, that we can trust that God is going to take care of us, that we don't have to worry about carrying the burdens of tomorrow with the grace that God provides for our daily bread because we are to trust in him each day. And that trust is what makes the difference. The Pharisees reacted to Jesus' healing of this man by wanting to arrest him and kill him. But what he did for that man who he healed was changed his life. He gave him hope. We need that hope. And we receive it because over and over again, God isn't a stubborn God, but his love flows out in the forgiveness of our sins, in the strengthening of our faith, 
and the giving of his own son through his body and blood that we receive that food from heaven. But God has also called us to be the instruments in the world to let people know that they can trust in God to provide for them as well. People have all kinds of reasons why they don't think that's true. And maybe they, from their perspective, are not willing to give God the chance to show it. But we can be witnesses of the ways in which God has worked in our lives. And through our example, through our stories, through our encouragement, the truth that God is not hardened and not stingy, but that his love overflows and that his resting in him is for the benefit of us. That we don't need to be greedy or angry, believing that our time belongs to us and that we should be the Lord of our own Sabbath and determine what we should be doing on Sundays or any other day of the week. But instead, our time belongs to the Lord and that he wants us to trust in him, to rest in him, to realize that as the Lord of our Sabbath, he is the Lord of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.